Good evening, everybody. Hi, folks. How are we all doing? Let me just get the Facebook live stream started. And as always, if you'd like to tell us where you're watching from, say hello to this week's presenter. Please do. Getting this Facebook live stream started so that people can watch over there if they want to. Here we go. And it is live. All right, hi from Ethiopia. Thanks for joining at this late, late hour. All right, and for those of you who are just joining, feel free to say hi, tell us where you are joining from. I see some familiar folks in here tonight. All right, cool. Well, it is a little bit past the hour. Hi from New York and Iowa and Westminster, BC, Indonesia. Excellent, hi from India. Algeria, gosh, yep, we got an amazing range of places again this evening, morning, afternoon, hi from Sudan. Cool. Well, Anajima, you've got a very international audience and a lot to say, so without further ado, I'm delighted to hand it over to Anajima Saikia, who will tell, tell us a little bit about taking good care of our language recordings. Welcome, Anajima. Thank you, Anna. Um, am I audible? Am I clear? Yep, you sound great. Okay, perfect. So this is, uh, it's early morning here, very early morning, in fact. So Namaskar Huprabhat, uh, that is the ASMEs for um, hello, good morning. I'm Anujima Saikya. And Today, I will be talking about metadata, file management, and the basics of Elan. So this is supposed to be a very, it's, it's supposed to be an introductory uh, workshop into how we conceive uh, these three topics or yeah, how we basically conceive these three topics. So you must be uh, shocked, not shocked, a little baffled, uh, more or less the same, as to what is a dog doing here? So this dog here is almost like my alter ego. Uh, so uh, this dog is exactly my face when I was in my master's. And when I was actually told or when I realized that field work is not only about meeting amazing people, uh, living with amazing people, experiencing their lives, uh, learning a new language, et cetera, but a field work actually entails learning softwares doing those dreaded Excel sheets and transcribing. And so I was like, really? Is this what I signed up for? Okay, so we go to the next slide and I'm still equally confused. Do we really need to learn all of it? And uh, after so many years of doing field work and learning more as the process continues, is I learned uh, there was a very important point that I took home, and that is that a resounding yes, a definite yes, we need to know what is metadata, we need to know how, the, um, how transcribing softwares work, and the earlier we know it, the better it is. Because as I already mentioned here, it is one of the few ways actually and it might come shocking to a lot of people, but it is actually one of the few ways in which we can truly uh, contribute to the community. So, um, yeah, so what do we mean by that? Let's get into uh, why do we think that documentation matters? So here uh, I'm speaking about the Penobscot situation. And I'll start with this to give you a brief introduction as to why does documentation matter. 
So Penobscot is an indigenous American language of the Eastern branch of the Algonquin language family was traditionally spoken in uh, mine, but currently it has no first language users. So um, like many other Native American communities in North India, um, sorry, like many other Native American communities, uh, starting around the 1800s, what really happened was um, uh, there was a criminalization and a punishment which was imposed on students um, who were speaking their ancestral, their ancestral language. So they were living in government boarding schools. And by the time they returned back to their families, they had completely forgotten their mother tongue. They had completely forgotten the language. So in the past 40 years, in the, Penop, uh, in the Penobscot community, within the uh, Penop, sorry, within the Penobscot community members, what was seen that there was an increasing number of suicide and um, uh, somebody working on uh, the language revitalization of the Penobscot community said, I quote, is that we internalize oppression as a result of which we have high suicide rates. And so this was the situation which was, which was ongoing. There were no speakers of the language remaining. Um, there was no shared history to which uh, the people in the community could go back to. They were speaking a foreign tongue because of which the, the internalization of oppression, years of oppression was of course traumatic, which lead, led to an increasing suicide rate. So what Carol Dana did, um, who I just quoted, she uh, she um, compiled an anthology called They Still Remember Me, which has 13 traditional tales about the tribe's cultural hero, who was known as Gluska. So here on your left, you actually have an image of uh, Gluska. So uh, this person here is Gluska, and you can see him converting another person into a tree. And this, uh, as I think you can see here, sorry, my frame is a little too high here. Uh, yeah, just a second. Yeah, yeah. As you can see here, it is, sorry. It is, um, it was on the book. It was on the book, but sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry, I'm getting the bar underneath. Yeah, it was a scrapping on the Burke Bark by Thomas Joseph of 1884. And the way I got it was definitely through one of the archiving sources. So what happened was uh, because um, in 1918, um, there were certain Penobscot legends which were documented as uh, in terms of phonetic transcriptions by an anthropologist called Frank Speck, and that was uh, archived. Using those documentations from 1918, um, there was a dictionary of Penobscot which was produced, which is in line, which is being produced currently. So what we saw is something that was done in 1918. So the situation here till now is that, uh, for the longest time, we had a language with no uh, speakers. It was only the elder generation, then the uh, then uh, the generation before Dana. Nobody was speaking the language, and by the time it came to Dana, there were just a couple of uh, people of her grandmother's generation who were speaking it. But because in the 1918 we had Frank Speck who had started working on this language, we had some archival sources. And because of which in the 2020s, 2022, even currently, there's a linguist called Connor Quinn, who's actually working on the dictionary of Penobscot. So coming together of both of it, the dictionary plus um, the, the myths and the folk, to, folk, uh, folk tales of Gluska together, brought in this idea of a shared identity. 
and further Penobscot is now being used as an act of decolonizing and healing. So in a society which led to such high suicide rates, now language and uh, the folk tales are being used to bring in um, an idea of shared identity. And it is very interesting because I was reading, as you can see here, um, I uh, did provide a link for a New Yorker's um, article. And here, actually, Carol Donna, who's been working with the revitalization work of Penobscot, said that um, it's amazing how in Penobscot you can actually speak full phrases and you can uh, narrate expressions through just single words. And she gave us some examples as well. For example, uh, lunch is noon eat, butter is milk grease, canoe is that which flows lightly on water. So after speaking English for so long, when the Penobscot speakers went back to speaking it or reading stories which spoke about these words, it brought um, a moment of joy for them. And this is how uh, the revitalization situation in Penobscot has been looking extremely um, empowering and it is being used as a tool for decolonization. Another example of and Anglo, uh, sorry, uh, another example of um, an uh, Algonquin language is the uh, Wampanoag people and the Wampanoag language. So back in 1903, there was a dictionary which was uh, written and that dictionary was more or less derived out of the Eliot's Bible which because of certain archival sources, because there were um, digital copies of it. In 1993, um, um, a woman called Jessie Little Doe Bain, she actually reconstructed the pronunciation, grammar, and vocabulary uh, to, 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 um, to sort of visualize uh, the Wapanak language re uh, reclamation project. And it has been one of the most, um, uh, it, it has been one of the most successful documentation or revitalization of uh, a language which was quote unquote dead. So uh, in 2014, a handful of children were actually growing up as the native speaker of the Wampanoag language. So these are two very important examples onto what could happen, right? If you have uh, archival sources, here we saw uh, bits of archival sources which were sort of um, reconstructed to form entire grammars, entire vocabulary, etc. But then there are also situations where this isn't always the case. Um, I'll go back to the next slide. And this is from uh, the state I am from, which is Assam in the northeastern part of India. And here you see um, an example of the Thai manuscript, the Thai Ahom manuscript. So Thai Ahom has a similar story like uh, Wan Panong wherein, um, because it was the language of the kings, they had the manuscripts and the manuscripts have been preserved because of which even though Thaya home is now considered dead, there has been a lot of work now on reclaiming Thaya home. But uh, for instance, another Thai language, which is Thai Nora. So within Thai languages of Northeast, there are seven, uh, varieties or seven languages, out of which uh, three of them are have a lot of speakers. They are um, spoken, uh, they are spoken. There is a lot of intergenerational transmission, uh, but uh, there are a couple of them which are slowly uh, getting extremely endangered. In fact, Thai Kamyang, one of the languages out of the seven in the group, 
has less than the last time I went there, it had less than 35 speakers. So um, the, the situation of Tainora, which has which could be included or excluded from this group is a little critical because the only documentary proof of the existence of Tainora is by uh, Grierson back in 1902, where he did mention Tainora, but we do not know anything more about it. Uh, at that point of time, in fact, in 1902, as I've mentioned, there were only 300 speakers. So now there are propositions that probably Tainora, uh, or speculations that probably Tainora was the same as Tain Kamyang, but we do not have conclusive evidence or enough archival data to actually prove or even disprove that. So this is all speculative. So there are a lot of languages across the world where due to a lack of archiving uh, or a lack of good archiving data, we, in, we could lose them pretty much in the future. Um, okay, so let's go back to the, let's go to the next slide. We, at this point of time, uh, we want to take a pause for a bit and look at these two sentences here. Number one is, what is data for us is the lived experience of a language speaker. It is an important index of their identity. Number two is, when we enter a community, we disrupt their everydayness. So what do we mean by these two uh, sentences? Um, as linguists or as outsiders entering into a community, um, we look at somebody's culture, somebody's language, somebody's identity as a cumulative whole called data, right? Data, the, even the terminology is a reduction of somebody's lived experiences. And it is, an, in fact, an important index of their identity. So as an outsider, when we enter into a community, we, there is a general flow of things, of life, and we disrupt that flow. We disrupt that everydayness. And this should be, or this should ideally be the starting point. And the starting point of a researcher entering a community wherein they are an outsider is that of a disadvantage. And this should be a very, very important point. And this should be a reflective point. Uh, so we start at a deficit here, as I said, and it is our responsibility to prioritize the community and give back. Archiving of data, hence, is one of the most crucial ways or a crucial step in actually trying to give back to the members of the community. And it completely depends on what the members really want, what kind of archiving they want, how do they want their data, all of that. Uh, even though we'll come back to, we'll come to it in a bit, but all of it are very important considerations that we need to take a moment and think about right now before we get into the nitty gritties of terminologies. Data in hard drive would die with us, or it would just stay with a couple of people who we hand the hard drive to. So this is where exactly, and the reason why we need to follow the step. We have data and our process should be to archive it. Data is of two types to give it very, very large uh, classification or diversification, primary data and secondary data. I'll get to it in uh, the next slide. But for now, it's divided into primary data and secondary data. Um, we at all costs need to prioritize community access to the data. Say once we collect it, and uh, it is very important that we speak 
to the community members, say the stakeholders, which necessarily not be the elders, but most time it's the elders, the gatekeepers, say the village headmen, pradhans, etc. Uh, and the members of the community in general, we sit down with them and we ask them categorically as to how would they like their data to be. So we need to prioritize community access to the data. We need to find a digital archive or a repository that will accept uh, your documentation data. Or you can also make your own arrangement with that archive. So uh, a lot of universities have um, uh, repositories or they have um, tie ups with archives, et cetera. Um, so that is something which has to be uh, found out before you go into your field work or else if none of that exists, you can make your own arrangement with the archive. You can talk to them, uh, you could see, um, you could you could see uh, how are the policies of the archive, so on and so forth. Uh, going to the next slide. So here is a list of around 60 archives of the world. I just listed it down to uh, for everyone to more or less have an idea of uh, where they are, how they are. If you want, I can also come back to it, share it again. And uh, different archives also deal with different parts of the world. For instance, me being in, uh, uh, in, in South Asia, there's Corsal that works a lot. Um, then there is also the Endangered Languages Archive, which works with uh, data from all across the world and so on and so forth. Um, going back to what really is data. A data is a collection of numerical or textual observations, which can be cleaned, processed, used, and analyzed for many purposes. As I'd already shown before, there's primary data and secondary data. So primary data is the raw, unedited, untranscribed untran uh, version of it. Um, it is the very raw audio or the video or the original observations that one has. The secondary data, on the other hand, includes the transcriptions, translations, morpheme breaks, annotations, so on and so forth. Okay. So here we have an example of a data. For instance, we say that this is uh, uh, an example of data from the world of art. So what do we see here? There are two. Uh, major observations that come out when we look at this. The first is that we see a man kissing a woman, and then we see some rectangles and flowers. And those are the two basic things which comes out. Also, of course, one can say other things, like there are little concentric circles in between. Uh, there is also a lot of yellow and the color patterns and so on and so forth. But at the start of it, these are some of the observations that come out. Uh, but suppose we go to the living room of somebody at some a friend's house and we saw this painting. Do we really understand what's the background of this painting or what is really happening in this painting? I don't think we understand what's really happening. So this is where we bring in a little bit of description through the very basic of a descriptive metadata. So a descriptive metadata here then gives us a little bit of detail. For instance, the title, the title of this very famous, rather very famous painting, I'm sure a lot of you all know about this, is called The Kiss. We see the creator here being mentioned, who's Gustav Klimt. The date created, 1908-1909, the physical dimensions, the type, and then we have the mention of Belvedere here, which probably looks like the, um, the gallery where it is stored or the archive where it is stored. So this is the basic descriptive metadata where we kind of know what is really happening, a little bit of detail. Now let's go into this. 
here, if we suppose take this out of our drawing room or a friend's drawing room, and we want to locate it in a gallery. In the gallery, we have to then associate it with other paintings. So how do we then do it? First, we could probably put it with the paintings from the 20th century, because as we already saw before, it was around the 1908 or 1909. Uh, we could also put it as under symbolism, which was a movement, a movement, an intellectual movement, a movement within uh, art and culture that had come out at that point of time. There were other artists who were part of this movement. There was Frida Kahlo, there was Pablo Picasso, there was Edward Munch. So probably if we put this painting of Gustav Klimt with Frida Kahlo or Pablo Picasso's painting, maybe it will make sense. The third was the Vienna Secession which was um, another movement. So probably if there are other painters from that time, for instance, Otto Wagner or Joseph Hoffman, we could also pay, put the painting with them. So this is how metadata really helps. So we have the data here, which by itself doesn't convey a lot. But when we see it with a little bit of description, the descriptive metadata, or when we see it in association with everything else around happening uh, around, during that time, we can contextualize it. So this is what we call a metadata. Ideally, research data should be accompanied by a supporting document, also known as metadata, that helps to explain what the data are about. So in a very stereotypical, uh, description, it's known as data about data. Um, so that is broadly the idea of metadata. In language archiving, we use the term data very broadly to include any recorded observations of language, including sounds, images, writings that can be transcribed, translated, glossed, watched, read, listened to, or measured for analysis. Okay. So Going to the next slide, I would want to just give me a second. Uh, I would want to give a metadata sample here. Let me check if I can. Okay. So can everybody see the sample? Uh, Anna, do you see the sample here? Yep, there it is. Okay. So this is in fact actually um, a metadata example from uh, Kaipu Liohone, which is the archive of the University of Hawaii at Manoa. So most archive would have their own metadata sheet uh, with um, a pre-generated format. For instance, this might look a lot, right? In fact, <laughs> it's, it's even, um, Okay, it's even a lot more, you know? Um, just to give you a brief example, see, it just keeps going on and on and on. So at the first glance, it could be a little intimidating, but um, to be honest, while you build through it, it's not actually that difficult. So what really is happening here is, uh, here you have the item name, right? This is uh, Anna's abbreviation and the number here. So here you see it's all in one sequence, right? There is a complete numbering. And the reason behind this is because all of it is actually a video file. All of it is a wave file that you will see uh, probably here. Yeah, you see digital wave file. So because all of it is just one kind of recording, it makes sense that it's all listed according to numbers. We will definitely come back to um, how the file should be named, what are the conventions, et cetera. But for now to introduce the metadata, this is how it broadly looks. You uh, have a file naming um, convention here, then you uh, write the, con the name of the language, the language code, if there is one, if there is an ISO code, you put it here. Uh, uh, 
then you write the uh, the name of the languages and again uh, the ISO code and so on and so forth. There are also um, a description of the area, the description of what the interview is about, who the speakers are, who's the contributor, and you can go on and on about, and you can create a lot of columns here depending on uh, first the archive, for instance, if they already have a metadata list, good, you can just keep on filling it accordingly. If not, you can also make one from scratch, which would, which would also obviously be a lot more time consuming, but that would mean that you can also put in your priorities, depending on your naming conventions. Okay, so this is the very basic of metadata. If you want me to come back to it and explain some more by after uh, the end of the doc talk, I could always do that. But going back now, to the uh, presentation. So that was the metadata sample. So going back to our data, now we would broadly look at how uh, data should be, um, should be sort of organized so that it's easier to be later on uploaded to an archive. So we see here that there is something called a session. So uh, generally what happens, what precedes a session, which I haven't mentioned here are resources. So resources are part of a documentation. Uh, let me give you an example. For instance, um, there is a session of recording going on where uh, say you are describing, um, uh, say the folk tale, a folk tale uh, in a particular language, right? So while you are doing that, during that session, there would be, say, a video recording, an audio recording, there would be somebody clicking photos, so on and so forth. So those individually, a photograph um, of, of that, uh, of the recording, say, or um, the audio recording file and the video rec recording file would be in uh, would be individually known as resources. And these three resources would come together to form a session. And uh, a corpora is basically a specialized, it's a type of a collection actually, wherein it is largely used to build uh, dictionaries, which is, it is mostly, it has a, it has a purpose. That is why a corpora has been. And the most important thing here actually is the collection, because uh, the session, the corpora, all of it forms a collection, and the collection further goes on to form the assemblages. So I'll start from the assemblages. So why, what is the assemblages? The assemblages are the combination of everything you have collected. Let it be photos, let it be videos, let it be audio, whatever. All the data that has been created are assemblages. But then when we curate the assemblages, we call it a collection. And a collection is exactly what goes to an archive, not the assemblages. Because suppose you have clicked 10 pictures of the same recording event or the same event, right? In one, pic uh, one picture, the first picture is at a 45 degree angle. The second is a little blurred. The third is um say somebody comes in between or whatever so on and so forth out of those 10 images you would want one image to go into uh the collection the one which you think comes out best out of it but in the assemblages all of it go so why do we need to curate the assemblages to go to the collection that is primarily because archives uh do not have that much space as well that you put all everything that you have collected. So we need to carefully curate it, make the collection for it to be ready to enter the archive. So just to give you a brief breakdown, this is what a collection is. We'll come back to the collection in a bit again. 
Uh, now we will quickly go to file naming and file arrangement, which is very, very important because this one step or rather two steps would actually, uh, actually save a lot of your time, a lot of your effort and a lot of your frustration in the future. We just went through uh, the metadata sheet, right? And what we saw here, oh, sorry, what we saw there was that there was sequential ordering because it was all the movie, uh, the wave videos, sorry, the media files, which were wa uh, wave videos. So there was 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, that was sequential ordering. But suppose we have an example here, right? We have cooking story one, cooking story two, cooking story three. So what do you think is the issue here? For me, I think the biggest issue with naming something within a sequence is that it doesn't tell me enough. When I put it up in the archive and say somebody 100 years down the line looks up for it, they would be so confused. They'll be like, okay, uh, what is this cooking story about? Is this uh, where in what community was this cooking story recorded? Um, when was this recorded? Was it recorded a thousand years back? What is it recorded? 200 years back? When was it actually recorded? So there's absolutely no more information. So for sequential ordering, it actually makes sense when you're sharing it amidst uh, your colleagues, co-workers, then the sequential ordering makes more sense. But it is actually the semantic ordering which gives us a lot more insights into the organization of data. So how a uh, uh, semantic ordering comes in is probably a little like this. We have the language code, we have the location, we have the participant name, we have the date, and we have a little bit about what it contains. And then whatever the extension is for here, it's wave. So I've continued with wave. Because uh, Cyrium, the language that I'm working on, doesn't have a language code. It doesn't have a um, ISO code to be particular. I have written it as Cyrium. I've written the full. The location where I've collected it is Balisar. The participant name from whom I collected it is Faka Aimol. Here is the date. So this is generally the date convention. It is year, month, date. And this is very important to follow it. Uh, then it's cooking story one dot WAV. So at starters, what is the problem with this sort of, you know, um, this sort of uh, order? For me, to be honest, if I uh, go into it, my biggest problem would be, uh, probably it's too long. Maybe that'll be one of my first considerations. And some other condition, uh, some other considerations would be that, okay, we already have the metadata sheet, which already explains us what the categories are, right? So why do we need to put all of it here again? Why should we be, be so repetitive? So because of certain questions like this, uh, though there have been a lot of guides which have been created now as to how do we uh, name our files. So these are some very important tips. I call them the seven tips, which have been taken from the Princeton University guides. And these tips are first, they should be named consistently. If you are following, say, uh, language name, uh, place, um, uh, participant, date, um, information. If this is what you're following, be consistent, follow that throughout. Uh, there should not be any shifting of things from one side to the other. The second is that this is important. So uh, some of the archives actually want characters which are below 25. So if you actually look at this one from before, this is way too long. And so that is one reason why I tried to bring it below 25. Um, I put further abbreviations for this because again, we have the metadata sheet to fall, fall back on, right? 
so that all of it individually can be extended or explained in the metadata sheet. Hence, again, reiterating why the metadata sheet is so important. The third point is avoid special characters or spaces in a file name, extremely important. Uh, they will not be accepted. Use capitals and underscores instead of periods or spaces. Again, very true. Use date format, which I already said, this is the conventionalized date format. Include a version number. Um, write down the naming convention in the data management uh, in the data management plan. So if you are, um, say, using the abbreviations, write it down. Just know what your larger plan is. Uh, the next part of it is um, how do we arrange our files? Now that we know how to name it, how do we arrange it? So going back to what I had spoken about collections to sort of um, recapitulate, there were the uh, um, assemblages, right? Where all of it was there, right? All your data, photos, videos, everything, um, photos which are blurred, photos which are not blurred, et cetera, et cetera. From there, we curated the collection, right? And the collection is what goes into um, the archive. Now the collection further contains folders. The folders further contain media files. And this is largely, this is largely how the convention is. And we have two structures. One, sorry, one is the flat structure, which actually a lot of in fact, many digital uh, archives and repositories have a flat structure. Uh, mostly the uh, digital repositories, they have a flat structure um, in which folders may only contain media files and cannot contain other files. Whereas uh, there are certain archives which do also accept nested structure. So what is the difference between a flat structure and a nested structure? And why is it important? Let's look at it briefly here. Um, this is what is a flat structure. It's very simple. For instance, you have the collection here. We are going back to the Gustav Klimt example. We wanted to, uh, uh, we wanted to locate um, a work title degenerate art in the collection, and that is our sole motive. So what do we do? We go into archive.org, a very well-known online archive, and here we see that these are the collection catalogs. We, what we do is we click on the first one, which is underlined, the LACMA catalog. The moment that we click this, we are taken into the folder here, which has all of these um, all of these media files here. You can see, right? But as I already stated, I want degenerate file, degenerate R, sorry. So what I do is within the folder, I click into degenerate file, degenerate art. Sorry, I don't know why I was saying degenerate file, degenerate art. And this takes me to this particular media file, it immediately opens it. Easy, right? It's just three steps. And we Google it, uh, we go into the collection, we open the folder, we choose what we want. But say, for instance, going back, if it was a nested collection and within LACMA catalog, I want to degenerate art, but then I, I'm presented with a lot of other things of uh, Gustav Klimt. For instance, I'm given with all the paintings that he has done, all the pictures, all the video files, the audio files, say they are all of it and they have been nested. They are all there together. That would just mean that for me to find a very particular thing that I'm looking for would be A, time consuming, and two, I might have to open further folders and further folders and further folders in order to reach something that I've been, that uh, that could just very easily be cataloged 
like this. The same kind of files being put together in a sequence. So yeah, this is what is um, um, a non-nested for that matter, uh, a flat structure as we've seen here. And now uh, we will go back to our original idea or the original schema of what we've been doing so far. We should take a break. I know that it's been a lot of information, a lot of things to process. So let's take a break. Let's take a breather. Let's go back to where we had started. We started that we wanted to achieve this. We have our data. We wanted to make it good enough through primary data and through secondary data so that we could make it uh, good enough for an archive so that we can archive it. Now within the primary data, we looked at a couple of things. We looked at the structure of the primary data. Um, then we also looked at how to name and store primary data so that it's, it can be easily uploaded to an archive. And in terms of the secondary data, we looked at the basics of metadata, how to uh, fill in a metadata sheet, a metadata file. And now what we would look at is the process of annotation through Elan. So annotation is a very important part of it, right? So annotation is um, in a non-linguistic definition or even in linguistic definition, uh, those are just scribbles and those are just, uh, um, you know, notes that you have. So transcriptions, et cetera, all of them come under annotation. And then Elan is one of the easiest and one of the most widely used annotation tools. And um, unfortunately, because we had to pack in a lot and it's been, it's, it's supposed to be an introductory um, uh, workshop. Um, we will not get into the complete depths of Elan, but then I would like to show the very basics of it so that somebody who wants to go into a community or for that matter, their community, and they want to, you know, collect data and then, um, and then make it and then annotate it, um, make it, um, make it good enough for an archive, what would they do? So I can show the basics, but then uh, I'll show the basics for now. But then if you have any questions or whatever, you can always ask me for sure after it. So give me just a second. I will um, try and share it. Um, okay. Okay, is, is this visible to everyone, Anna? Is this visible? Yep, Can you see your blank Elan screen? Yes. So Elan always starts like this. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> to be honest, I was just thinking about my initial times on Elan because most times I was like, why is it blank? There should be something, right? What do we do? What did we do wrong? But this is how Elan is. They give you all of the space in order to uh, do what we'll do now, which is we will press on new. Um, the reason why it's not an extensive workshop is also because um, not everyone here is trained in formal linguistics, and I presume not everyone has Elan. Uh, so I would just briefly show you. Um, how it is done. So I clicked on file, I opened a new, and this is a folder. So there are a lot of folders. You can choose it from your desktop. You can choose it from your library. Um, you know, you, this is an additional folder I have and so on and so forth. But now I've already chosen my folder Spiti. So within Spiti, I have say 
all of these uh, further nested files, but then I will just go for this. So I click on this and then what I do is I shift the file here. And there is a reason why I do this, why I don't directly open from here, because as you see here, there is an option of a template. So what can be done in Elan, which makes it of course very easy hence, is that you could have, uh, say you are working on 1000 sentences that you have to transcribe. You can make a template for one, right? And all the 1000 sentences say are about person marking. And then you can make one template and then you could reuse that here. You could add, you could also select, you could select your new file, you could select your template file, and then, you know, you don't have to make the tiers and the types uh, every single time you use Elan. But because for now we don't have a template, we'll quickly see how that's done. For now, I've chosen this and I click on OK. Okay, this, yes. So what we have here then is this, we have, um, you see the recording, the recorded waves here, uh, to give you a brief introduction into what just happened, we imported the audio file here, right? These, these are where our tears would come below. Um, uh there are a couple of keys here if you can see this if you press on this this will play the whole file we have a similar hook here one under selection wherein if you say select something let me just go to say a random part in the file just to show it very quickly um let me go to uh say i'll go to the end um okay, what looks decent here? Can I see a wave somewhere here? Let me see. Is there something here? So we can try listening to it. This is the selection, say like how I've selected this, right? We could try playing this. Yeah. There is something there, but then it is uh, not super clear. Let me try and find if there is something which is probably a little clearer. Um, okay, I'll just go back a little bit and see if there is something. Yeah, so because we see that here there are something, right? We see a little bit of things here. Okay, now let's check. Okay, there is something which is a lot more clear. Uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, can everybody hear what's being said here? Is it audible? Yeah. Okay. So here we hear Bahar, right? So what we can do here is that um, this is the space of our uh, transcription. This is where we will transcribe our data. But before we get into transcribing, what we have to do is that we have to create a type and a tier. So what really is a type and a tier and how do we really create it? Let's check. So uh, people who are, say, um, Indo-Aryan speakers would probably know what is being said here. It is it says Bahar, which means outside, which is a, a postposition in Hindi uh, that we use. So now that we know that it's a postposition, let's see what we can do is we can go into type. Uh, we'll add a new tier type. We will write the type name as uh, postposition. Okay, wrong spelling, postposition. Um, and 
uh, we will not get into control vocabulary, etc. for now. Uh, none of this. And we just add this. Okay, so here we see that we have a postposition tier. We have a default tier as well, but uh, so generally what we do is we delete the default tier. Nobody really knows why that default tier exists. It has no work. It has no purpose whatsoever, but because we are, are running a little behind time, we will not engage in deleting the default tier, but generally we do delete it. So we just click on add now. Uh, okay, so this says this because I already have uh, something called post position. So let me just call it probably, um, um, I don't know, position. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, let me just call it position for now, just to make sure there are no uh, anomalies. Okay, so now we have something here called post posi uh, position, and we also have uh, post position, which we could uh, delete it, but for now, let's just keep it here. We'll see what happens with that. So we add this. Ah, oh, God. Okay. Uh, we might have to just delete this. Okay, I will get into this again. Wait, I'll add new tier type. Uh, so the issue is that because I'd already created these, uh, I have to first delete it off the tier and then I'll have to delete it off the type. But, okay, let's try this again mm, because i'd already i'm so sorry while i was trying it i had already created uh this particular tier for sorry this particular type for bahar it's coming in again i'm really sorry but then um for me to delete it with me and i'll have to go back to tier first delete the tier and then only i can delete the type but for now let's just keep it here there is a particular uh uh, type called post position. Let's just keep it to that. And then we'll see at what's at tier. And if we check here, a tier comes under a type, right? So now say if I write the tier name, the part is there, uh, the tier name would be uh, out. Say, I'm sure even this will say that it's already, ex it already exists because I'd already created it. I should have just Taken a different name. The participate. The participant is say um, Abha, right? The annotator is Anujima. The parent. The parent tier is uh, none. The tier type is now. We have two tier types because I created post position and I then created position, right? But let's say we put it under uh, post position. What happens then? See, so here we get this. Okay, now this one comes. We have uh, out here, which is uh, the tier. Then we have the type, which is post position. The participant is Abha, the annotator. It comes here. What we could also do is we could also uh, arrange the tiers depending on uh, color preferences, right? So we could also, uh, for instance, see if we want the entire tier. Uh, as one particular color, we could also arrange it as say, uh, I don't want the green there, but I want say the blue there, I could also do that. So, um, and if I want to highlight the tier, I can also do that. And so highlighting the tier depends on, again, if you want, say we have two speakers and I want Abha's tier to be highlighted in one particular color, which is this. And say the second is Ashok who's speaking and I want Ashok's to be in a different color. We could also do that so that there is a difference between um, the speech of Abha and the speech of Ashok. But for now, let's see how this goes. Apply. Um, 
say we do it all tiers with the same participant apply and let's see what happens uh, okay i'm so sorry this one um i'm so sorry for this do you think um do you think anna there's enough time for me to uh, highlight another section and then do it or do you think i should just briefly wrap this up because the bahar part i'd already done it that's why it's showing me that i should keep changing the tier and the type do you think i can choose another part of um of it from ilan should i show it or what do you suggest to you yeah if you think it's a useful demonstration go for it but i think that ilan also takes a lot of practice and this is a good yeah. example for everybody that things go wrong in ilan and it's just normal yeah i mean um yeah, yeah i mean to be honest the, the only thing that happened here is that i should have deleted my existing type and tier and right because it is nested so a tier is nested within a type so one has to first delete all the tiers and then the type and then uh that is what i should have done but i did not do that i'm really sorry but i'm trying to so uh yeah so basically what would then happen would be okay let just me just let me give me an example let me just give an example. So because we already created the tier out here under type, right? Uh, we just don't have a parent tier here, which is okay, but we have a tier type, as you can see, which is post position, which has already been created. Uh, here, the, the selection, which is, we can just double click it and uh, we can, just write transcribe it as bahar for instance right and then we click anywhere outside and this selection stays so uh this we could also do for longer files right um here on the left hand side once the default is gone here on the left hand side say if you have three speakers you can uh make three speaker tiers if you have, say, uh, if you want to differentiate it based on, uh, if your work is on post positions, for instance, and you have, uh, in, you're working on a language which has out, in, uh, corner, right? You can also make three tiers depending on that and so on and so forth. So whatever tier you make is completely based on the kind of work you do. So for now, just to show you one in out, I have Bahar here. And okay, this is uh, not the correct um, transcription. I'm so sorry, but yeah, just presume it's uh, the correct one. And to qu quickly show you how then we export it, what we do is file exporters, we export it as a interlinear text. We click on this, and what we find here is this. We have the uh, uh, the word which is being transcribed, Bahar, and here it shows the time duration. At what duration in the entire data has Bahar been spoken? And because we are talking about very, very long audio video files, right? That is why this is so important so that this is just one of the entries, right? But suppose you have uh, an entire interview that goes for an hour, it will be uh, it will be extremely crucial to know within what time duration, what particular um, postposition was spoken. Say, if I'm working on postpositions, um, there are a couple of options here, uh, right? That you can see. One can always check out. I usually prefer Showtime code because um, the data that that is time aligned is actually very very helpful. You can also see what happens when we show uh, tier uh, labels. When we see here, we apply changes. See, this is what comes. The default comes because we didn't delete default, and this is the tier which is out. 
and we have uh, Bahar and the time duration. So there are a lot of options here where one could, depending on the preferences, choose, apply. You can also uh, edit it depending on your line spacing and so on and so forth. So uh, this is what we do. And then we can um, save it in a document, save it in the desktop. And then later on, we can also uh, open it as a Word document, wherein it will show us, um, we could import it or open it as a Word document, wherein this will, um, this will come out as an annotated sheet. So this is um, the very basic of Elan. I'm again, extremely sorry because I was practicing before, um, right before this. And um, yeah, I completely forgot to delete the tiers and the types, but I hope irrespective that you all got a very, very brief idea. If you all want, there can of course be another, um, another uh, session on Elan this can that can be also be a practice session which could be longer one can also talk about control vocabulary etc there are a lot of other aspects but we can always get back to it this is supposed to be very introductory so uh, just to give you all a very brief idea so going back to where we were in the slide uh, we spoke about the primary data, secondary data, the structure, the basics of metadata, uh, the annotation tool, which is Elan. And we did a brief uh, Elan tutorial. And uh, just to sort of uh, bring it all together in a step-by-step -step plan or a step-by-step -step workflow, uh, suppose you are say either an outsider getting into a community, going into entering a community, or you are somebody from the community, it is very important that we have this workflow in, in the head. The first step is to plan. Uh, generally, you know, um, what are we going to um, document? What are the kinds of questionnaires we'll do? So on and so forth. The second, is to write down the key metadata. The third is to make a recording and make sure that we move the raw data to the computer. We rename the data using the file naming convention that we just spoke about, depending on uh, if your goal is uh, um, large, if, if you want to uh, put it up in the archive, um, and you want to keep make your um, work easier, then one can, follow the sequential um, uh, naming convention, um, or if you want to just uh, store it for now, you can use, um, you can use, um, uh, you can, you can use uh, just, you know, uh, the numbering tradition and whatever makes sense. Uh, you make, it's very important to make sure that there is a good backup in the external hard drive, uh, it is highly recommended that while you are still in your field work, you fill in the metadata sheet, uh, which you must have already gotten by the time you are in your field work. Um, along with that, uh, we've already learned very little of Elan, how Elan works, and how uh, data can be processed using LAN, how one can use it for transcription and translation, make sure to uh, back up the process data as well, and, uh, and eventually archive all the data with proper file name. So this is more or less very roughly, you know, in this, um, uh, in this workshop that we have tried to see, that we have tried to go through. Um, so tying all the ends together, so there are three large uh, functions or three large goals to um, archiving uh, or to uh, documentation and what you do of the data is one. We have to look at the accessibility of the data, uh, how accessible the data is. Uh, that can be seen through metadata, how uh, well the metadata is, and the metadata gives us accessibility into our primary data. 
Uh, the second thing is how discoverable the data is. Uh, how well can it be uh, navigated depending on whether it's um, uh, what kind of archive it is, whether the um, believe in uh, sequential arrangement or nested arrangement and so on and so forth. But then irrespective, it's very important that the data is discovered and it's not, you know, once you collect it to make sure that it's not um, kept uh, in a hard drive or somewhere where say 100 years down the line, it cannot be accessed by the community. The third thing is the uh, functionality of it and um, how the data can be revived, retrieved, how the data can be used. This also brings in a lot of things which we didn't dis describe or discuss now, which we could uh, again uh, take it up later, which uh, includes uh, the legality aspect of it. For instance, um, you have um, the copyright, uh, the issues of copyright. How do we know about copyrights? How do we negotiate copyright? So that is another complete aspect of both metadata as well as uh, publications and community work, which we could always take up, of course. But then these are the three key aspects through which it's very important um, to make sure that uh, your data is accessible, it's uh, it can be discovered, and that it's uh, that it has high functionality when it's needed. Um, we follow Austin 2021 in considering the role of archives to be appraising materials that is collecting selectively based on a stated goal, preserving those materials, making known their existence, and facilitating their appropriate distribution. So when we speak about distribution, distribution, again, as I pointed it out here, circling back to what we started with, prioritize community access to the data. It's very important to do that. When we speak about facilitating their uh, appropriate distribution, distribution not just ends with the research community, but more importantly, it also has to go back to the community and we have to make sure that we negotiate it with the community. We make sure that uh, we prioritize uh, the fact that they can access it in a language which is comfortable to them. And uh, these are some of the links. Uh, I didn't put in a bibliography because I have uh, largely um, uh, cited whatever, wherever I've taken from, but then these are some very important links that one can look into. Um, I can come back to it, talk about it more um, if you want, but then um, for instance, archiving for future is an excellent, excellent um, tool. Um, then there is open humanities, there is um, archiving and language documentation from, the Cambridge Handbook. These are again data, uh, These are again very. Uh, these are again uh, resources that are available online for free. And um, finally, uh, that's me. Um, circling back to where I started, that's a picture of me disrupting their everydayness. And yeah, and then uh, the burden definitely lies on each one of us who are um, documenting a less known endangered language to make sure that um, the community has complete access and rights over the data. Um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. And I'm Anujima. And I hope this was uh, at least a little helpful. Um, yeah, thank you. All right, thanks so much, Anajima. Let's have a big round of applause for that extremely informative pre pre presentation. And uh, I think there are some questions in the chat and the Q&A if you feel like taking those. Uh, okay. And if you want, I will pull them out of the chat and uh, paste them in so you can see them easier. 
Okay. Um, okay, I'll just go on it from the top. Just give me a second. Uh, okay, there is a question uh, by uh, Tasfai Nagesh Bayu. I'm sorry if I'm not uh, pronouncing your name correctly. Um, he asked me if the version of Elan Matter in archiving, I mean, uh, to be honest, I've been using my version 5.7, even though there are new versions now, I've been using this version, uh, I would say, at least for the past five years. And I've personally not faced any issues, right? And um, I think it, this is the thing with versions, right? There are always some um, uh, some betterment a little bit here and there, some bots that, being, that are being taken care of. But uh, by and large, I think, at least for me personally, uh, this is the version that I've been very comfortable with and something that I've been using for years. And this has worked uh, perfectly for me. Did that answer your question? Yeah. OK, so we have Rosalind Mirasol. She asked me, would it be possible to share with us, Elan? Can we download it from a secured site? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you can actually uh, download um, LAN. And I think Ronnie Harris also uh, gave us, thank you so much for that. He also immediately uh, given the um, link from where it can be downloaded. So the MPI archive is an excellent, MPI is the Max Planck Institute. The archive is excellent for a lot of such resources. Um, yeah, and uh, the next, yeah, that is so true, uh, this five, right? This five, that is so true. I mean, I also felt like there was so much that had to be sort of put in together in an hour because Elan in itself to go through it properly takes an hour, right? If we have to understand Elan, if we have to go through the steps, et cetera, it takes a really, really long time. And because we did three broad things here, um, it was rushed. I'm so sorry. Of course, as I have been saying, if you all want, um, more sessions later on um, that can definitely be arranged and I would love to do it for sure. Yeah, Ronnie says way better than copying, pasting type code into self-made spreadsheets. Load. Yeah, for sure. And also in self-made um, um, spreadsheets, for instance, what why I love Elan is because it gives it to you down to seconds. So that becomes, um, for instance, uh, difficult, right? Sometimes to just like um, figure that out during a speech or depending on however you are creating your metadata. Yeah. But Ronnie, thanks a lot. As Anna said, thanks a lot uh, for being um uh, so quick with the answering and the questions. Thank you so much for being so interactive in the first place. I think we get a bit of an understanding of Elan. It does seem very flexible. Okay, thank you so much, Robert. I I still feel like it was a bummer that um, I forgot to delete the type and the tier. That would have made things way more beautiful. But then uh, we always... Um, there's always a next time. Uh, Tisfai says, do we only 
Excel, use Excel sheets for metadata. How about the best software for metadata? Which software is best for metadata nowadays? Is there any change, development of metadata software? Okay, so um, that's why, um, again, to be honest, metadata in itself could be a two hour long session, right? Because there's so much happening in the space. Um, there is, um, there is, for instance, say more, which is doing a lot into bringing together, um, together a lot of platforms trying to also make metadata easy. There is La Meta also, where, which is doing things. So, you know, depending on uh, what metadata convention you're talking about, uh, um, and what sort of metadata again, right? We have, we already saw at least two kinds of metadata. Um, for instance, write-based metadata uh, or uh, copyright metadata would be completely different. That would be the administrative metadata. So in order to collate and bring together all of it, Excel is sort of um, something that has been used for years now, right? Even though there is a transition that's been coming out um that, that sorry that has been coming in um but yes we should definitely talk about metadata probably have another session where we can deal with it individually look at softwares probably learn a little bit more about how uh say more is trying to be more integrative and so on and so forth um thank you rosalyn thank you katie uh, I already, okay. Thank you, Wasin. Um, yeah, Elan is free and you can download it from MPI. Uh, there is a question. I think this is an administrative question uh, to uh, Anna. If we can have a separate session on Elan, probably we could. Um, Is there a standard way to save the symbols and the fonts in the archive? So um, this is, as I already said in the beginning, it's very important to decide on the archive or the uh, um, repository in the starting, in the start, right? Because every archive uh, and every, uh, not every, every is a blanket statement. Most archive and most uh, repositories have their own conventions and how or what is accepted according to them. So um, this, it's generally the, um, so it's generally the archive or the um, uh, repository that will already tell you what are the symbols or what are the fonts or whatever, what is used. But then the seven uh, tips that I spoke about, those are largely universal, apart from the less than 25 character um, specification, because most archives actually don't have that, but some archives do, and that's why we put importance on that. But largely, it will be uh, archive and repository dependent. So that's why one should figure that out first and then start building the metadata sheet and then figuring out um, how should one go ahead with um, the data. My elder was asking about some tapes that have black mold on it. Uh, okay. Mm. Is that okay? This is um, not really something that is my forte. This question um, by uh, Tara Rose. My elder was asking about some tapes that have black mold on them. Is there any way to save them? Uh, to be honest, uh, I wouldn't really know about it. And I, I mean, if somebody in the audience would be able to answer this, um, amazing, please uh, help Tara here or Anna, if you know how to save um, some tapes with moles, would you know how to do that? I, I know that it 
theoretically is possible depending on how bad the yeah. mold is and how long it's been there. Um, mold can accelerate demagnetization of audio tapes. And if they've been sitting around long enough that they're moldy, they may already be very demagnetized. But there are archivists and like audio specialists who do offer, I've never had to do this, they, they can like vacuum the mold off very carefully and see if it's still magnetized. So your local university may have library technicians or archivists who can help you with that. That's probably where I would ask. Yeah, so we always have a person who we run to when it gets super, super technical, for instance, like this. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, then it's very, okay. So, uh, yeah, I would suggest then um, you should ask uh, your university um uh, technician, I'm sure he'll be able to help out uh, in this regard. I'm not very sure if a linguist can help out with this. Of course, until and unless they have a previous experience, personal experience in removing mold. But uh, I would suggest if you have a university technician, that would be a very, uh, they would be a very good uh, starting point. Uh, yeah, I think we are at the end of our questions. Yeah. Do, do we have more? Oh. I think that's it. All right. But if anyone has questions going forward, feel free to post them in the Facebook group. Or Anujima, are you open to having people email you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can put my email ID on the chat box. Perfect. And um, please let me know if you have any questions. I would love to mail you back. Um, so, uh, so that is my email ID. Yes. Saikyanujima right, at the red gmail.com. All right. Well, thank you again so much, Anajima. This was a wonderful presentation on some tough stuff, but you made it so accessible. Thanks so much. And uh, next week, we will have a slightly different format. We will be meeting an hour later than usual, but we will be hearing from Stephanie Witkowski at 7,000 Languages about some free tools to build dictionaries, including talking dictionaries and learning courses and other language materials. So we'll see you next week. Can't wait. And have a good night or morning or afternoon, everybody. Oh, and Anujima, I think you put ah. in your email just to the host and panelists. So I will ah. copy ah, it back okay. in. <laughs> oh, OK. I, uh, OK, thanks. Oh, and I think you had like a special character G. So everybody, if you copy that email address, it should just be a plain normal G, not a fancy IPA G. Okay, I will try to rewrite that again. <laughs> I completely lost that it was only for uh, panelists. Yeah, I've done Zoom that too. Sometimes, yeah, Zoom sometimes can be so difficult to navigate. <laughs> just like a lawn. <laughs> Yeah, just like a lot. One thing goes here and there, and you have to delete tiers and tires and <laughs> the joys of technology. There it is. All right. There it's so right. everybody. Okay. Grab Anajima's email address. She will be happy to answer any questions. And thanks again. Take care, everybody. Till next week. Thank Bye you. Bye.